I just received a thumbs up. So I assume that we've started. Um, it's quite difficult for me to address you, whereas I cannot see you, but I'm uh, just acting as if the room is packed. Uh, you might remember me from last time. I'd only had to summarize a number of questions and that went well, apparently. So I'll do some more today. And uh, warm welcome to all of you. We've received 120 registrations. That's a lot of people and it is great to have you here. This is the second Purpose College of a series of six, all dedicated to the economy of meaning. And today we will be talking about sustainable chains. It's an honor to introduce our two guests, Ronald De Boer. He's Associate Lecturer at the Electorate Supply Chain Finance. And there is also Hans. I have to have a look at your title. Hans Stegemans is the Chief Investment Strategist at um, Triodos, who will zoom into this topic. During the lectures of uh, both gentlemen you can ask questions for the dutch attendees it means that you questions will be answered during the lecture and um, all in all we will gather all the questions anyways when your question is not answered during the lecture we will answer them afterwards via email after the two presentations, we will be divided into breakout rooms. I will um, be part of one of them. You've registered and we'll give you some more information at a later stage. And then um, to conclude with, why am I here? It is an important question to answer. I am the co-founder of Ragnarok Clothing. We started this year and we are a sustainable clothing company and our vision is to find an alternative blueprint and to design that for producing and selling clothes. And I don't think I have to explain to you that a sustainable supply chain is a very important topic for us as well as a challenge. A lot of people have read something about the clothing industry. A lot of attention was paid to this industry, industry over the last 10 years, but it's a very pollutive industry. And the supply chain makes it very difficult to guarantee sustainability. And that is why we wanted to address this issue. It's also a very important topic for us. So I hope to learn from this this evening. Ronald, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. It's great to hear what you are working on. Welcome to all of you. It's a bit strange to stand here uh, in an empty hall, um, but there's an advantage to this as well. I just heard that my daughter is watching and she's in Amsterdam, so that's a great thing that that is possible. I want to tell you something today about sustainable supply chain financing, and I plead that by cooperating within the chain, we can make a difference. And there's cooperation in the field of financing, as that is really necessary in order to bring about change. when we talk about sustainability and is good to start with i think because not everybody is as familiar with this subject um, you might think of carbon dioxide emission etc and it's very important it's an important part of sustainability but that is not the only important thing you probably know this uh, image people planet and profit are three things we have to have a look at um, if we have a look at our planet and sustainability um, planet first and then, but also the people. People are influenced by the chain. They work within the chain. 
and then you have to think about child labor and the health of employees. And then there's profit. Also important, some students are sometimes very enthusiastic and they forget about profit. I um, once worked at a large American firm and they said it's only sustainable if it's also financially sustainable. Because in the end, a company has to um, make break even in order to be a company and remain one. So these three aspects are important. Also refer to at uh, the three P's or triple bottom line. There are different models and another model that I like is the donut model of from Oxford University from Kate Rayworth. And it actually says that when we're talking about sustainability, there has to be prosperity for all people, which means there is a minimum social fundament that meets all the needs or the minimal needs of all the people. That is enough food and good food and drinks, access to healthy water, health care, education, etc. So that is the social foundation that we all need. That economic growth also has to take place within the means that our planet has to offer. There is an ecological ceiling. And what I like about this model is that they've tried to make um, that insightful by measuring it using a number of key performance indicators. And you see that we're not there yet. 11% of the people does not have access to enough healthy food, for example. And it also contains um, carbon dioxide emission, etc. So it's all about the total image. What does it have to do with the chain? If you have a look at this green dot, you might be an entrepreneur watching this evening. It might be your company. Um, and you know better than anyone that you're not alone. You always depend on other companies. There is competition, it's a red dot. There's the customers and they have customers. And then at the end, there's the consumer, the last part of the chain. But we also depend on suppliers. And they often have a supplier who have suppliers. Companies are a part of a network of undertakings and they're all related. And today we cannot speak about sustainable companies without speaking about sustainable change, especially when you're talking about the circular economy, which is not the topic of my speech this evening because other people know more about this. But when we talk about circular economy, I always say there are no circular companies. There are only circular change. So you need to have a broader perspective. So then it starts at the very first supplier and it ends at the consumer. And that is the image that we have to take into account, which is difficult in practice. Because often we know our suppliers because we picked them or selected them ourselves. But who is our supplier? Supplier make things more difficult. Yet, it is important when we talk about sustainability because a lot happens within that chain, even more so. Sustainability starts with the chain, and that's my plea. A number of years ago, McKinsey published a research into the impact of the chain on sustainability, and it appears that if you have a look at the natural capital impact, that's the impact on air, land, biodiversity, water, and its ge geological sources, it appears that around 90% of the pollution takes place within the chain. So not within the operations of one company in the western part of the world, but within the entire chain. So you can put up solar panels and it is a good investment. You should do it, but that's um, there's more necessary. If we have a look at greenhouse gas emission, including carbon dioxide, we see that the impact within is caused within the chain. And here is a tier one 
or scope one, two, and three, and you see that the biggest part of the pollution takes place further down the chain, which is often in developing countries where there are less rules and regulations. That's where the most of the pollution takes place. And therefore, it is very important to consider the entire chain when discussing sust sustainability. Sustainable supply chain finance, the interpreter refer to this as supply change. I mean, I love the term. I might have to introduce that one, supply change. But what is it about when we talk about chain financing? I simplified the chain. I mean, I just explained that it's an intrinsic network, but let's assume it's a simple chain. If we take a traditional approach, we see companies, they're the dots, and various different companies have a different size, also a different uh, level of power. Larger and multinationals have a lot of power in negotiation, and smaller companies have less power. And there's also such a thing as credit worthiness, um, whether or not it's easy to go to a bank and get a loan against good conditions, low interest. If you're a Unilever, Procter & Gamble or Philips and you go up to the bank, you have a good credit worthiness like AAA and you're able to get a good loan with an interest under 1%. However, if you're a farmer in a developing country where you uh, process coffee beans or produce palm oil, if you have a bank account, you can go to Wang Bank and if you're able to get a loan, you pay high interest, at least seven to ten times as much. So what you see is that power is not evenly distributed and the same goes for credit worthiness. I mean, we know that it's a known fact. If we have a look at the impact on environment and social aspects, which is sustainability, it's often the other way around. The larger dots are the companies who have a lot of impact on sustainability and the environment, and the color indicates the performance level. And what you see is that especially a farmer in a developing country has a huge impact on the environment, but at the very same time, not a lot of power and credit worthiness to bring changes about. So they have a low performance rate when it comes to sustainability. This is a good thing to realize and also an important starting point. And I think therefore that sustainable chain financing is an essential part when we're trying to solve the sustainability issue. A bit more about chain financing. I won't elaborate too much because of a lack of time and you might not even be very interested, but let me give you an example of how chain financing can work. Chain financing very simply put, is two or more parties within a chain, um, often a supplier and a buyer. They together work together in order to reduce risks and costs. And then we're talking liquidity, financing, money flows, cash flow. A famous example is reverse factoring, also known as supplier finance. What we see here, we have a supplier, a buyer, and a financier. And the buyer, I assume, is a big company, and the supplier, a small or medium sized company. What it's about is that there's a difference in credit worthiness. The buyer is able to get money cheaper than the supplier. Now, what happens is very simple. The supplier delivers goods to the buyer and sends an invoice per post or email, PDF, whatever. And the invoice is sent to the buyer. 
the buyer approves the invoice and that happens fairly quickly because usually with a payment term of 30, 60 or 90 days, the supplier will only find out at a late stage whether or not the invoice has been approved, which causes uncertainty. And that's often a problem when it comes to financing for SMEs. But in this case, it has been agreed that the invoice will be approved within like a day or five. The financier, like a bank, for example, knows that there is a buyer with a good credit worthiness and they will pay, especially when it's a bigger company. The bank will know I will finally get my money. So the financier will transfer the money to the supplier. The um, supplier does pay a fee for that, but it's always a lower fee than if the when the supplier would have um, asked for a loan. And after the payment term has lapsed, uh, the supplier will pay the bank. Here's an example of two companies working together in order to improve financing. And the difference in credit worthiness between the supplier and buyer is used which can be very useful in order to improve the working capital position and take risks out of the chain, especially in times of crisis. It's not very sensible to extend your payment term. I mean, we've been able to read it in the media. Companies, big companies, we all know by name. And in February, March, they said all of a sudden, um, we are going to extend our suppliers payment terms. It's not a sensible thing to do, not for publicity, but it also creates risks within the chain because a supplier might go bankrupt because of that. So it's a useful means for that, but, but we can also use it um, for sustainability purposes. A good example was implemented with a renowned brands as Puma, Nike and Levi's. They have suppliers in country with high interest rates and a low level of uh, sustainability, but they supply these companies well. So they entered into a cooperation with the IFC, a commercial um, data company, a subsidiary of the World Bank. How does it work? The suppliers are audited they will get a score how well they perform in the field of sustainability. And they pay attention to three aspects. First of all, safety for the employees. Is it a safe building? Are the circumstances safe? Second, environment. What's with pollution and other ecological aspects? And then number three, um, the standards of labor, no child labor, enough freedom, etc. These three companies send auditors to the suppliers on a regular basis or even visit them themselves to see if they abide by these agreements. And there is a minimum in place. You have to get to a minimum standard to be a supplier of these companies. So you get a score in these three fields. If you score high, you will get the financing of it against a very favorable rate. So you get a financing discount. Lower rating uh, will make sure that you have to pay more for the financing or you won't even get financing. So sustainability is rewarded within this chain. So that's why we call it rewarding supply chain finance. That's one way to go about. Another example is to be found within the coffee chain. A colleague of mine, Lisa Zon, visited Colombia in order to see how it goes within that chain. She spoke with coffee farmers and learned a lot. And what she saw with the number of these coffee exporting companies is that they had a relation, good relations with a number of farmers and when there was enough trust and the farmer showed that he had everything in place, then up front they'd provide them with financing, a working capital loan. 
there were a number of conditions attached to the loan, of course, when it comes to sustainability. Uh, biodiversity, use of chemical substances, um, labor circumstances, etc. And then once the farmer had harvested its product and the coffee was delivered to the exporter, the full amount minus the loan would be transferred to the coffee farmer. This is an example of chain financing that is not rewarding but enabling. So that takes place prior to the delivery. What is important in this situation is that there is enough trust that you, the exporter can really visit the farmer to check if everything is in place, what the expected harvest um, is going to be, etc. This is a system that works well. In the first place, the farmer sees its income increase and is also given more income security. And the same goes for the people the farmer employs, which also is a very important aspect. We also see impact on the environment. The processing of waste, filtering of water, um, chemicals used in biodiversity. It's good to hear that a number of farmers actually was able to see that when they had more diversity, they'd see more different species of birds, for example. So this is a form of chain financing where a loan is given prior to delivery. I don't want to zoom into this too much, but ah, there's a question. I thought time was up, but no, there's a question. There's a question asked by Rulof who asks, how does the IFC get a grip on the suppliers? The suppliers, suppliers, that is. So the question is, how can IFC know whether or not the suppliers, suppliers are doing well? Um, insofar I can answer that, it's the buyer like Puma or Nike who audits the suppliers its suppliers and then for IFC it is important that they can um, on average make enough profit but that's a good question I don't want to zoom into this too much because this is not a circular economy lecture but we have to realize that when we move towards a circular chain, it has an impact on the work and capital need. You cannot see this business model completely apart from cooperation and the business model. If we just start recycling, we need more working capital. When we start remanufacturing, so buying parts in order to make the product turn it into a new product, you have to invest more in your working capital. And the working capital you need is increases when you are refurbishing. And in a pay-per-use model, things get even more difficult because you need even more capital. Therefore, collaboration within the chain is essential. And there are possibilities. I'm not going to give you an entire list of possibilities, but if you rent washing machines, it might be very important to work together with a manufacturer like Nilem. And there are already examples of companies who've um, gone about this way. In short, if you want more sustainable chains, we need to pay attention to financing. Now you might wonder, I'm only a small entrepreneur. I'm the green dot within the nice network that you have on your screen. I don't have such a high credit worthiness. I mean, what can I do? And I would like to say, I believe that there are possibilities. You're not always the most powerful link in the chain. And if you're big and powerful, um, it's easier to act within the chain. But I do think that with the right mindset and with cre creativity, it is very much possible. 
by cooperating within the chain. Interesting is that chains traditionally were uh, looked at from the point of view of old fashioned theories. However, today there is a networking view on these chains as well, and they show it's not about power, it's not about having the highest credit worthiness, but your position within the network also provides you with influence that influence you can use to make the chain more sustainable so i think if you are embedded within your next network and you have strong relationships then slowly but sure, surely you can make the chain greener more sustainable that is what i wanted to share with you Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. My name is Hans Stegerman and I work for Triodos Investment Management, not the bank, but Triodos Investment Management. Is that something else? Yes, it is. During Ronald's story, I had to think of what we do. We invest. We invest in Nike, for example. But we also work with microfinancing the farmers in those countries so that they can get a microcredit. So we work within that chain in Trider's Bank. Is financing entrepreneurs in the Netherlands as well and trying them to reinforce those networks and make them more sustainable. And that is the part Trider's plays in the Netherlands to try to enforce them, empower them within the network. Will I be talking about sustainable change? I wasn't planning on it, but I think I might want to address this after Ronald's talk. The story has to be about the world in times of COVID, especially on a day like today. You know, a vaccine is around the corner and stock exchange goes up 5%. This is about a time in which we can make the choice to change. It's a purpose college. It's about making decisions and a purpose. I want to talk to you about the Corona economy, reset the economy and business models, and I will introduce some chains along the line. I have 30 minutes, so I will continue. The Corona economy. What is the Corona economy? It is the way the world looks right now. What effect does a virus have on the economy and what are the long term effects? And it starts off quite simply. It's a very simple image. There's a virus started in China. It's spread around the world and there are direct effects on the health of people and the well-being of people, people who die or fall ill. And as an economist, I look at this and say the direct effect is not very interesting. I mean, people who die are economically not very relevant. Most of them are 80 plus and it's not a good thing, of course, but economically it's not very relevant. And why am I saying that? During the Spanish flu, it was different. We're talking 1919 and it hit the working class. Well, the people who were working the most. So there were less male who were able to work and that led to emancipation of women. Women got to vote. So those were direct effects of a pandemic on society. Even technological um, developments because more devices, less people, etc. We have restrictions now, therefore nobody's present here in order be, so that we can suppress the virus. It's also about mobility and consequences uh, for econo economic activity as we have seen in the past few months. 
that is the first stage. What I'm doing, um, let me explain. I'm adding to this image and I'm going to explain what the extra arrows mean. So there's an error. What does it do to the ecosystem? Because at the beginning of the year, the story was as follows. Less economic activity, so less uh, particles in the air. And we also seen during the first six months, there was 9% less carbon emission. So positive temporary effects on the ecosystem. There's a question. There is a question from Gijs. Reverse factoring, is that possible for starters and small and medium companies or large buyers only? And what's the effect on the interest for buyers? Ooh, that's a factoring question uh, for Ronald, I think. Um, can we address it later? I mean, I, I can answer this question with my background, um, but I don't work for the... Uh, for the bank as such, but in investment. So let me continue with my story about my arrows. So there's an ecosystem effect. Um, there are positive effects, as I just um, told you. But we saw in China that the carbon emission in May was higher than the year prior to that. So without these restrictions, we'll be back to last year's level, probably. Now, human well-being, an arrow to economic activity, which is the number of people who are working. Less economic activity means less jobs. Less job means less money. Less money means less income. Governments helping, they're stepping in. We've seen that uh, because they need to inject healthcare, for example. And in the end, it has effects on our happiness because that's what it's about and nothing else. We are in this last era. We find ourselves there in the past few months and we're talking about by doing something here, can we make the world more sustainable? Can we make sure that that entire economic system becomes a little more sustainable? That is um, not very easy, I'll get back to that. But what this also shows is that the companies who were hit the hardest at the beginning are the companies who bridge distances, so with long supply chains. So they're not regional companies, but the companies with an extensive supply chain and also very specific supply chains. For example, one region where all the parts for cars or iPhones are being produced. And then we see that the specialization within the supply chain is something that is very efficient and that is why car parts are being manufactured in China and assembled somewhere else and marketing and branding and the ideas etc they all come from the West. That's the business model of these entrepreneurs. Now there's a virus and the supply chain collapses, people start thinking, maybe we've made things a little too efficient. And maybe we have to move away from globalization and deglobalize, or at least think about how to do things differently. And then there's the financial sector who plays its part. It plays three parts, actually helping governments so that they have enough money. So borrowing money to the government who have to get into debt in order to keep systems running, help households, and also help the companies they have financed in order to make sure that the economy can keep going. We find ourselves in a second wave right now and this is going, this is now becoming difficult because companies are struggling and banks cannot keep financing everything. So what happens? More help from monetary authorities or central banks in order to make sure that this can continue. 
this was a neutral description of what we saw and what was the outcome in order to save the economy and i hope i'll get a question how this um amount is pronounced but before you ask me the questions let me give you the answer this is 20 trillion dollars which is five times as much as the entire country of germany manufactures and 16 percent of what we produce in the entire world it's a huge amount that has been used in order to save the economy it was used to solve the first large problems in the Netherlands, uh, the airline company KLM, for example, but also helping households, um, the self-employed, the small and medium-sized companies on a global level. Is that a good idea? I uh, disagree a lot with my fellow economists because they say, and we just had to save the system. And future generation will profit from this. That's opinion number one, a technical problem that needs to be solved. I have a different take on this because actually what you're saying is the economy was good, so we have to save it. That's actually what they're trying to say. We're not talking about what was wrong then. And that's a shame because it wasn't good. We had agreed on a lot of things, the uh, sustainability goals, the climate agreement. We had agreed to build a different system. So now we're spending 20 trillion and put it into the old system, knowing that we have to change it. And we're saying we do it because it's good for future generations. And I'm thinking they have to pay the, now twice. They have to pay for the old system and then they have to pay again to finance the transition. And I think we can do it in a different way. Maybe let me give you a bit some more perspective. This five to seven trillion dollars. the sustainable development goals, you would have been able to finance those for a larger part. I mean, this is on an annual basis, so you would need more, but you could have done a lot. You could have said also, we're still sending an explicit subsidy to fossil fuels worldwide of 5 million. So why not cancel those and then use the money to improve? Would have been a good idea. These are large numbers. Um, now, what do we have to do? I am currently talking about K and X. K is what we find ourselves in right now. That's recovery that you see that is in line with the number of graphs. You see that today the stock exchange is a 5% up. It was a record for the Dow Jones index which is strange because the rest of the economy is suffering. Employment rates are going up. Uh, the number of businesses going out of business is going up. And that is the lower line of the K. So there's a big difference between the financial world and what people experience. I don't think it is a good idea. I understand why it is like it is. And I agree partially that sometimes you have to do this in case of emergency, but we're six months down the line and we could have done it in a smarter way. So I say, let's cross it out, the X. And that is think about where you want to spend your money on. So de-scale things that have no future, it is harsh, uh, but if you know that it has to happen at some point, why not now? And then of course, I'm talking about KLM the airline, Dutch airline company, if you know that it has to become more sustainable, you can write down a set of conditions. If KLM can become more sustainable, good. But the only thing our government does is fight about the salaries of the pilots, but not about making KLM a more sustainable company. That's weird. So descaling when there's no future and then convert what can be kept. For example, K 
KLM if you can pull it off. It's a good thing. And, you know, you have to make sure that when you're spending community money or government money, make sure that there's an incentive and a condition and then construct construct and implement new initiatives. I've written about it before. The worst thing you can do is to keep all the companies running at every cost and keep them employ people because what you do is you make sure that people are stuck in companies who might not have a future and you need these people to start new initiatives. So maybe you should really think about this and support these people and offer them perspective as well as some security. If you keep people in the current system, it's not a sensible thing to do. So the X is what we have to do. So you just press the button and you're there. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. Before I move on with business models, um, just a bit of economics, which is important to understand the business models that I will be referring to. There is a question. You were talking about the 20 trillion and Jos asks, where does the money come from? Does it come out of the market? 12, 12 trillion is from the market. Governments um, bar lended the money on the capital market. Our pensions, for example, were borrowed. The remaining 8 trillion uh, is to be found on the balance sheet of central banks. It is purchased in the secondary market, but it was not paid with other money. It's not really money, at, at least it's not money that you uh, find in the economy. So the 12 trillion euros is an extra debt for governments. And they globally have the highest debt ever. Right after the Second World War, we had the highest debt ever, and it was paid off because of the growth and innovation, etc. And debts are higher than right now. And how can you pay back a debt, future generations, that is either by growing economically, which is a bad idea, I'll explain that later, or by very high inflation rates? that make um, debts disappear, but that's also a bad idea, or by agreeing on no payback. So this is the problem that is caused by um, the corona recovery. And in 2021, everybody will start worrying about debt, but they are not doing it right now. Now, economy. This is a simple representation of economy. There's financial flows, there's companies, there's households. You know, they exchange money within a supply chain or elsewhere. We call it economy. And the quicker the arrows go, the more economic growth. If you have a look at business models and entrepreneurship, this is the general view of people profit, loss, profit maximization, etc. Transactions, this is also about transactions as long as you sell stuff. And everything that deviates from this creates this problem of ownership. There's no transaction around that thing, that product. There's only a transaction of usage which bring about risks because as producer you're still the owner of for example that washing machine now how do you check how that washing machine is used whereas when you sell the device you don't have to deal with that you can even make sure that you manufacture a device that uh, breaks down after two years so you can sell some more 
that is a market incentive that has to do with the transfer of ownership as well as business models that can be created around it. Once you start changing that, you introduce extra complexity within that economy. Now the more complex idea of economies that there's still a restriction or a limitation and it's not just the economy there's also an ecosystem and maybe there are borders i mean we've known this for 50 years yet it is becoming more and more clear that boundaries matter i said when i was building sandcastles at the beginning of november on the beach Within an economic system, it's not just an exchange of um, labor and capital, but it's also about energy. Without fossil fuels, etc., and waste and heat, it doesn't run. I mean, there's resources, renewable or not, and that creates waste. This is a more intricate idea of an economic system. And first of all, we had the simple system and that was logical because we just started to produce more goods and um, made our business models around that. Now, if the economy is less relevant, you need to think of new business models. I'm going to introduce something else. I'm going to take out the center where I had the arrows just now and I replace it. There are some coordinating mechanisms in there now. It was about the market before selling things, but we can do more than that. And that's exactly what we do with our family. We are not talking about the market. We're talking about reciprocity, about doing something for somebody that used to be a very normal mechanism. Another coordination mechanism is redistribution. Keep this in mind because this can be used to make business models. And instead of just talking about the economy, um, the exchange not only of money but values is important. So, this is what we need to introduce business models. Well, maybe this quote. We were talking about the circular economy, but the inner circle of circular economy you have, and then the outer circle is recycling. You've already made waste and you see if you can do something useful with it but the highest value is refuse not do something so there's no waste but i have not found a person to be able to create a business model around this no business model no financing However, this is important to keep in mind when we talk about sustainable business models. There's always this challenge as opposed to the market economy that I just painted is that it's often less. I mean, you want to be more sustainable. You want less waste. Economy is a very efficient system, but it's full of waste. The only thing that we're doing within an economy is make people buy more and seduce them to buy things they don't even need. And we all know it. It's quite particular. There are seven business models for radical change. Change after COVID. Now, why now? Why after Corona? Because what we see now, and I read a, a piece in The Guardian uh, today, all that money of those governments, the 10 trillion is going to the fossil economy, an economy that has no future. Now, what do we have to do? 
And that is what my boss said this weekend. We are like tubes of toothpaste. The one side is seeing what governments have to do in order to get the, the lid off. And we have to squeeze harder. That is the role of triodos. We have to squeeze into this tube in order to make sure that the uh, sustainable economy becomes more visible. That is what these business models are about. How can you show that things are possible in these times? Number one is very easy, a shift from fossil to renewable energy, electrification, energy efficiency. You can make a business model that does something really different and still work with energy efficiency, or you can build a business model around producing it yourself. There's two different models. The making current business models more sustainable can cause what we call a lock-in. That you're doing something not sustainable very sustainably. H&M, Zara, the big fashion companies are telling us that they're becoming more and more sustainable. But if you have a non-sustainable business model and trying to become more sustainable, all you create is a lock-in in a non-sustainable system. Second, a shift of business models based on transactions from business models based on use or two business models based on use. So no transaction or possession adds value, but use. They're great examples of companies who are trying to establish this. However, it does not mean that it is sustainable per se. An example I always use is the swap bicycle. It is very clear you pay 10 to 15 euros a month you see that these bikes you can find the bikes anywhere because they don't pay that much money for them and it might be a good business model but the question is whether or not this is really more sustainable than just buying a bike there are also examples of uh, clients of ours like blue jeans they have pulled it off to turn it into a business model. Third, a shift from an economy based on planned obsolescence towards a business model based on maintaining value. This one's more difficult. In 1924, there was a, um, a partnership Philips produced um, light bulbs with a lot of burning hours, but they reduced the number of burning hours so that they could sell more. Now, if you want to produce something that is more sustainable, you need customers to be loyal. And you need to be able to give them the service they deserve when the product lasts longer. So you really have to take a different approach when it comes to manufacturing the product. You can maybe uh, work with uh, subscriptions or upgrades that you really make sure the consumer enters into a long-term relationship with you. If squeezing the tube does not work, just take the lid off and you know create guarantee schemes that last uh, with a, a limitation of 10 years. Fourth is shift from plant-based food and reduction of the global consumption of animal products. I read McDonald's had its quarterly figures released today. They have come up with the plant-based burger. And that is something that we see in the Netherlands. People want to consume more plant-based foods. And this is one of the most important things that we need in order to come to a more sustainable economy. 
And if you're able to prove that this is a positive choice, this business model will absolutely make sense for entrepreneurs. A shift from an extractive to a regenerative economy. Sounds a bit vague, but it's actually quite simple. When you know you are harming biodiversity, there's too much land use, you can't prevent global warming from happening, then doing less bad is not good enough. We have to head in the other direction. We have to regenerate. We have to make what's bad good. Farmers who give a part of their land back to nature, for example, farmers who are improving the land they've used instead of making it worse. Water scarcity will be one of the pressing issues. So regenerating water is one of the examples as well. This is also important, a shift from financial towards social business models. This is an add-on under a conventional business model. I say sometimes because you make something like a, a grilled cheese sandwich and you try to involve people with a distance to the labor market in that process. Quite simple. That works well when you have good entrepreneurs. Is it a specific category of business model? Not really. Um, the ways of financing, however, are different. How you do that together with municipalities, for example. Now, seven, a shift from business to commons. I wanted to show you, you can um, do it with the market, but why not think of other forms of ownership, the commons? And that has to do with doing things together just because you think it is the best solution. Whether it's about cooperative um, housing construction or farming together, all these forms are being experimented with because it provides a different incentive for people. Other than a financial interest only. And I think this is one of the business models um, that will create opportunities during the next few years. But all in all, what we have to do is create a better business model. The entrepreneur has to work hard now because the Rules within the market are still very old fashioned. But in the end, it is a better business model. That is what I wanted to add to that. And is there a question? Uh, there are a lot of questions. Um, and I'd like to pick out one, Jolene, for example. And Vilma asked the same. You said we had to de-skill companies that do not have a future, but who's to decide? Who decides whether a company ha still has a future or not? Uh, it's a good question, and it is a very simple answer when it comes to number of businesses. Um, let me limit myself to climate. We have entered into certain agreements as a country and a number of activities do not fit in with that. Um, well, in the end, it's politics who's to decide. I think the officials who've been working on these aid packages have to talk to the officials who can decide about this. We at Tridos, we have a number of goals and, you know, 
we have enough assessments of listed companies, whether they're sustainable or not. We look into that and then we decide whether that is sustainable enough according to our standards. In the end, it's up to politics to decide, to stipulate. We don't have that discussion right now. And that is because it's all about established interests. It's been easy just to give everybody money in the past few months to prevent this discussion from happening. This um, brought me to the end of my story. Can we have one more question or? There is one question from Hans. He says, what can we learn from the previous um, credit slash bank crisis? The last crisis was foremost a financial one. It had a different cause. And politically, it was very from a political standpoint, that was a lot easier because they could just point at the bankers. Uh, one mistake was made that is not repeated now. We started to cut costs fairly quickly as a reaction. And everybody has that in the back of their minds and say we're not cutting costs. I don't know if that's the correct solution because if you're now spending the money on things that don't help, it might not be a good idea, but that is the lesson that we all remember from the last crisis. And what we've not learned from it, and I've been saying that for 10 years, we should have learned that the relationship between the real economy and the financial economy was not correct. We're 10 years down the line now. At the beginning of the corona crisis, we had high debts and it's only increased ever since, so we have not learned from that. Thank you, Ronald, and thank you, Hans. Inspiring stories, awareness of the chain, and interesting business models. We've received uh, more questions that we haven't been able to answer, but the questions will be answered via email. We will part in a minute. We've received a lot of information and we will move towards the statements and we will be working in breakout rooms. Here are the statements that see to what you've just heard. After this life event, people will go to the breakout room as described in the emails that you've received. In every breakout room, there'll be a chairman of the discussion. And the purpose is to discuss these statements um, as well as expanding your network. We will do that up until quarter to nine and we'd like to have everybody back at a quarter to nine in the Dutch live stream. The English live stream will no longer be available and we will look back on what's been discussed and we will uh, make some um, agreements for next time. Thank you.